Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 88. <laughs> Story 3. Innocent When You Dream. April 4th, The Place. A long unoccupied house near Kalamazoo University, a slouching stone shape with warning signs plastered on every boarded up window. The time? Not that long ago. Long enough for the building to have been constructed with good old-fashioned American asbestos but not so long ago that people were still allowed to work there. It was one of the workmen sent to clear out said building that found the composition book I'm holding in my hands right now. Good thing he's a friend of mine and a fellow seeker of the unknown. He goes by the name of Nino Savant and the most notable things about him was his manly beard and his lifelong quest to prove the existence of the supernatural. You see, that was why he took any and every kind of job that gave him access to the creepiest buildings Michigan has to offer. I gotta give him credit, a decade in the game and he never once got arrested for trespassing. Genius idea. Wish I'd thought of it. From day one on the job Nino felt the hairs on the back of his neck prickle and he wasn't the only one that sensed something was wrong with the place. Other members of the asbestos removal team complained of headaches and nausea. More than a few men quit outright insisting that it wasn't safe to be there, that the whole structure was going to come crashing down on them. It didn't lean right. This are Nino's words not mine. He went on to explain that every building is a bit of a lean to it. No matter how well built a structure is gravity and the elements are going to have their way with it. Roofs sag, foundations crack, floors bend and bubble. And if that building is neglected the decay sets in all the faster. The poisoned brownstone in downtown Kalamazoo was no different, yet it was different. The floors might look as though they leaned to the right but the pull of gravity made you to lean the other way, and each room seemed to twist in its own direction. The walls and ceilings were no better. They left the workmen feeling as though they were lurching drunkenly through some carnival funhouse. Even the sunlight that crept in through the boarded up windows shone at all the wrong angles. The day that Nino Savant discovered a scrapyard diary he had wandered off from his seven-man crew. He'd spent all morning telling his co-workers that he might have some kind of stomach bug. It was a total lie but it's damn easy to lie when you're wearing a hood, goggles, and a respirator mask. He wandered to an untouched wing of the house and pulled the ghost hunting gigas he'd hidden inside of his flash spun, high density polyethylene coveralls. He slowly tracked his way from the study to the kitchen and back again. None of his tools picked up anything, not his EMP meter or his EVP recorder, even his spirit box was useless. None of it made any sense, there were dozens of reports from passers-by of sounds coming from within this building, strange vocalizations that haunted the dreams of anyone that heard them, especially those of children. It was on his third trip from the kitchen to the study that the floor gave away beneath him and he tumbled ass over tea kettle down a hidden stairway to an equally hidden basement. He lay there for a time, he neck bent at an uncomfortable angle, his legs splayed against the wooden door at the bottom of the stairs. The only good thing about his aching back and pounding skull was that it proved he wasn't dead or paralyzed. Once Nino got back to his feet he took a moment to examine where he had landed, there were thick, animal-like claw marks along the doorknob and bottom of the doorframe. He expected it to be locked but the it swung open easily revealing a small room. There was a small bed against the corner with a nearby overturned chair. As he walked to the bed something crunched under his boot, he looked down to see he had stepped on a painful looking glass medical syringe. You know the kind you only see in horror movies these days? The bits of glass were stained with a tar-like substance. Nino bent down to touch it but at the last minute thought better of it. Instead he approached the corner of the room. The bed was a hospital design at least 50 years out of date, the mattress had been torn open, springs and stuffing splayed everywhere. He almost didn't notice the small blue notebook shoved deep inside the mattress. It was the kind of thing you'd use to write your final exam essay. There wasn't enough light to read by in the hidden room so he walked back to the top of the steps, sat down on his still sore behind and started to read. Asterisk. 
When I was young I was prone to fevers and nightmares, something that my doctors and my parents alike put down to a weak constitution and an overactive imagination. Even I grew older and stronger nightmares continued to plague me, nightmares that no drug could keep at bay, nightmares that frequently had me lashing out violently as I awoke. As you can imagine when it came time for me to attend the university I felt I had no choice but to live alone. The lack of companionship only aided my focus on all things academic, my grades were strong and my instructors began to take a special interest in my academic progress. Unfortunately in my second year of studies I began to experience incidents of sleepwalking and nocturnal violence. On four separate occasions campus security had to apprehend me. This is how I came to the attention of Dr. Palatine, the university's leading expert on the subject of sleep disorders. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to say I was placed under her care and supervision. She was a handsome woman with iron-gray hair that was streaked with red, she wore thick glasses and spoke with an Eastern European accent. Dr. Palatine explained to me that she had just returned from a long sabbatical where she had been conducting what she called the purest research. Dr. Palatine shared with me her theories about the nature of REM sleep and the source of dream imagery in the collective unconscious. She requested I keep a journal and a tape recorder at my bedside but I must admit that the nature of my waking terrors left me with little clear or consistent information to impart. This lack of hard data to work from led her to invite me to live with her. I felt I had no choice but to accept. Dr. Palatine lived in a crumbling brownstone several miles from the college campus. She made a room for me in her basement so that my night terrors could be controlled and monitored with the greatest care. My first night and last night of observation began that ordeal that consumed my life. Dr. Palatine gave me a mild sedative and had me lie down on the cot she had prepared for me. She sat beside me in an uncomfortable looking, rust-colored chair, pen, and notepad in hand. Soon I was asleep and soon I found myself in the most lucid dream I had ever known. In the dream I found myself alone in the basement staring up at the single bare light bulb that was the only illumination. Dr. Palatine and the rust-colored chair were gone. A strange feeling of dislocation washed over me as I stood and walked up the basement stairs. I found the cellar door had been locked from the outside but I felt no panic at this realization. What better way to curtail my nightly meanderings than a locked door? I rapped on the door and called for Dr. Palatine, when there was no answer I began to knock louder and louder. I called her name over and over but there was no answer. The feeling of dislocation grew stronger and in my mind's eye I saw myself beating at the door in ever-growing panic. I looked so small, like a forgotten child. Without warning the basement door rattled on its hinges as though something had been thrown against it. Fingers scrabbled and grabbed through inch-wide gap between the bottom of the door frame and the floor, they were thin and covered with thick tufts of red hair. They scratched and scraped. Even now you might assume that this was all some sophomoric prank but my every sense told me this was not the case. Whatever was on the other side of that door was bestial and twisted. The grasping of the fingers became more frantic as though it were searching for something precious that was just out of reach. It was as though my every childhood nightmare was coming true. Hadn't the fear of seeing this very personal incubus driven me to night terrors and fugues? I screamed at it. The claw-like hand retreated, there was a moment when I thought it was about to retreat but then it began to sing. I cannot describe that voice, I do not know if that voice can be described. All I can say is that the sound that reached my ears was a loathsome crooning. An image arose unbidden to my mind, that of the creature burbling nonsense, trying to lull the pink quivering shape at its breast to sleep. Desperate to escape that sound I backed away only to lose my footing. I tumbled down the stairs striking my head and plunging my mind into merciful mindless darkness. How long was it until I awoke again? I cannot say, but I do know that I blinked my eyes to see the basement door wide open. It took me some time to find the courage to mount the stairs but when I did I found myself in a barren house. Of Dr. Palatine there was no trace, not only had she disappeared from her home she had also vanished from all university records. All my professors insisted there was no Dr. Palatine, 
that there had never been a Dr. Palatine. The more I told my story the more I became a subject of derision and unease. I left the university in the middle of the semester never to return. I found gainful employment far away from the university but I had lost the capacity to dream and with it I had lost all sense of certainty in the world around me. I began to fear that I no longer dreamed because I was still asleep in Dr. Palatine's basement, that I had never awoken at all. Asterisk. I should note that I said Nino started to read the blue notebook but when he got to the bottom of page 2 the door at the bottom of the stairs slammed shut. Then something behind the door began to howl and warble. The sound was a wordless invitation. It settled into his gut and pulled, it warmed him like a fever. It promised bliss. Nino almost gave in to it but the same instinct of self-preservation that made him step away from the broken hypodermic told him to run, to run, and never come back. Item, the old brownstone in Kalamazoo was eventually cleaned up and put on the market. It had plenty of buyers but not a one of them ever stayed more than a year. It was demolished in 2012, and a parking lot was put in its place. Item, my research shows that the Kalamazoo University of Science and Medicine employed a Dr. Emily Palatine from October 30th of 1992 to December 29th of 2001. It turns out that she was implicated in the Rolison 7 scandal. She wasn't one of the actual seven but there is no doubt she was a part of their bizarre experiments. Item, shortly after his long-sought encounter with the supernatural Nino Savant sold his ghost hunting equipment, shaved off his beard and went into the family dry cleaning business. Well not everyone has the starch for this lifestyle. What? I'm allowed to make a joke once in a while. <laughs> Story 2 my parents told me to stay out of the woods, I should have listened. I grew up in a small town in northern, well I'll leave that part out, the less people know the better right. As a kid I'd play everywhere but the woods, my parents always told me stories of bears and wolves, and even in desperation, giant beavers, to keep me out of them. I was always the curious child longing to go explore this forbidden mystery though looking out at night always gave me doubts about my adventurous ideas. The low-hanging mist soaking the ground along its edges and rotted trees reaching out at me from afar like twisted claws, it always gave me chills, the part that kept me away during the day was the howls. At night the forest was silent and eerie, not even the leaves would sway under the moonlight, only the sound of distant howls and moaning, like that of a man starving. One day my brother Beck and I were out playing with Molly, a beautiful border collie with the horsepower of a muscle car when she froze and first stood on end, it was as if she was the evil twin of the peppy spark we came to love and then began the barking and growling at the front lines ready to attack, it was like she was possessed with rabid fury staring straight at the wood line. We both heard it at the same time, the low moaning more breathy than at night but clear as day. We both exchanged glances only for a second and with the sound of a twig snapping the hunt was on, we saw an oddly shaped shadow dart deeper into the woods and Molly bolt off after it, we chased after her but it was no use. Both of us froze at the tree line, it had been burned into us all our lives to never step a single toe into those woods. I guess it's like when an adult hears that angry tone in their mother's voice they still freeze even if only for a moment. Beck and I both panicked, we needed to get Molly back but what could we do? Mom wouldn't be home for at least an hour and Dad would be at work till nightfall, who knows what could happen to her by then. Eventually Beck found courage that I still to this day regret. Listen Des we have to get her back, she's our responsibility and we can't let her get hurt. I looked at him like he was deranged Beck are you freaking insane? You heard it too. I don't know what it was but it was right there watching us, there is no way. Beck glared at me and without a word I knew he was right, I sighed and followed him across the barrier our parents had always created. The moment we stepped in it felt cooler, the warm sunny August day seemed to vanish under the canopy of decaying branches above us. We slowly wandered into the woods taking careful steps to ensure we didn't make much noise, or worse, lose our way back. Beck shakily cupped his hands to his mouth and shouted Molly, come here girl. 
I quickly smacked his bicep and aggressively hushed him. I don't know why, I thought we were being sneaky, but I didn't want to further risk whatever thing we saw to find us. Beck eyed me apologetically before stepping further. We only made it a couple hundred feet before I tripped over something buried in the leaves and crashed hard onto my knees. Des are you oh Beck's eyes widened with realization and he started wrenching violently. I stood up to help him clutching my knee as I did. When I finally got him calmed down, he grabbed my wrist and pulled me along. I protested and tugged the whole way trying to break free of his white knuckle grip. He finally stopped and let me go. Ow, what the hell Beck, that really hurt, what is wrong with you? He grabbed my other wrist and flipped my palm upwards revealing what I assumed was just mud from wiping my knees was dried blood soaking my entire hand. Whatever you tripped on wasn't a root, it was something's fucking lunch, it looked like someone stuffed beef and fur into a blender. I was skeptical, but his pale face told me this wasn't some prank. Beck we have to get out of here, we can get help and come back for Molly. We both looked around and realized at the same time Des, which way is out. We were lost, great. Let's try this way, I think that's where we came from I tried to sound confident but I couldn't stop shaking. We trudged in the direction I pointed out, and that's when we heard it, the loud moaning off in the distance, right in the direction we were headed. Uh huh. Follow me Des, quick. He sprinted off leaving me struggling to keep up. I never was the athletic star like my jerk of a brother. Beck would always tease me that I either needed to focus on academics or date someone rich, because there's no scholarship for being a klutz. My valiant tour guide led us into a turn that my feet couldn't manage and I went sliding down a steep muddy hill. Des are you okay? Stay still I'm coming I gritted my teeth as pain washed over my arm I'm not going anywhere dipshit now keep quiet. Des made his way down the hill as I inspected my arm, I must have sprained my wrist when I fell, it was already beginning to swell. Des got to me and began helping me up, when we heard the moaning again, though this time almost a howl anguished and angry, and much much closer. Beck spotted a small cavern that a tree had began growing over and we ducked inside. With my chubby frame it was a bit of a tight squeeze but with minimal scrapes I made it through. We took some time to catch our breaths, and I finally broke down into tears, I started getting choked up when Beck covered my mouth, we could hear leaves moving aside as something big stumbled through them. We edged closer to the opening careful to stay hidden in the dark, and we got a glimpse of it, it was almost human, with six long spindly arms that held up its malnourished torso, like how those people that have to get their legs amputated can still walk with their hands and its ashen green color was hideous to look at, but its eyes are what will haunt me to this day, its head was covered in eyes, at least twelve, all the way around with a big gaping hole on the crown of its head, it snarled and growled, as it searched around before releasing a horrific moan, it almost sounded pained. Then it spun around and bolted up a nearby tree and we listened as the soft thuds of it jumping between trees got softer and softer until silence. Neither of us wanted to breathe let alone go back out there with that thing, but our only other option was to wait here and starve, our parents would never find us in the woods, if they knew about this creature, would they even look? We stayed in the undercove to rest for a few hours and be sure that thing wasn't coming back. We didn't get much rest listening intently for that thing. Eventually we got confident enough to make our move and stepped out into the now fading sunlight it must be nearly sunset. We made our way back up the embankment and tried to backtrack to where we had last been, by the time we found anything remotely familiar it was dark. I've never felt more vulnerable than when realizing I was pretty much blind, lost out in the open with a creature that can move freely through the trees, and see in every direction at once. We heard the moaning every so often in the distance around us, and it drove us to keep moving no matter how tired we were. Eventually we did find one change to our environment, the tree cover had become much thicker and the sweetly sickening scent of death was overpowering. The ground had grown a lot muddier and twigs crunched, violently under our feet, prompting us to do the one thing we had agreed against, 
Taking out the lighter Beck kept on him we fumbled around trying to keep the light down low and found what we were stepping on was bloodied flesh and small bones. I stifled a scream as Beck dropped the lighter. We heard a guttural growl behind us and the sudden stampede of feet closing in inhumanly fast run Des. Beck shouted to me as he turned to run, but within his first step I saw something pierce out of his chest. Two fingers split down the middle with long claws at the end like that in a bird with he gasped for air before being yanked back like a rag doll, he kicked and punched in the ground gasping for breath as the creature began tearing into him mincing him like the animal we had seen earlier, he was no match and within seconds it was over, the animal began scooping clumps of my older brother up into the gaping maw on top its head. I had no time to mourn my brother, no feeling in me to cry I just numbly ran, adrenaline pushing me faster and faster, stumbling over rocks and roots. Until I finally collapsed. I couldn't breath, my heart was pounding, I could see the porch lights in the distance, I was so close, I knew I had to keep going. I tried to stand up on my wobbly legs, but a sudden wailing moan then a heavy weight dropping me to the dirt, I tried to cover my face, and screamed as the first slash, second slash, third, ripped into me my arm was throbbing, my side burned, it was over, I was this close and I was going to die. The world was so distant, but the monster shrieked its loud moan and fell backwards off me, I looked down through spinning eyes, and recognized Molly, she saved me. I should have tried to help her kill it but I ran, I ran towards the light. I kept running until I was slamming open the back door, my parents worried faces jumping to my side as I collapsed and blacked out, when I woke up in the hospital I was told my arm was mauled to mince meat and I had several broken ribs and a punctured lung, they were surprised I lived to make it to the ER. Despite my story the police chalked it up to hysteria and that we were attacked by a bear and my brother didn't survive, despite the search they only found his head and a bit of his torso. They never found a trace of Molly. That was almost 50 years ago now. My parents are long past, and I live alone in the family home. I still hear the echoing howl taunting me every night, I watch the tree line waiting, waiting for the day the it leaves the woods to take the only thing I have left. <laughs> Story 3. I can take the pressure. I can take so much pressure and I can take more. When I cooked for Mr. Olundel's family, my own family were being burned alive just outside. I could hear their screams, laughter, joy, fear and agony at being burnt alive. I kept on cooking though and I didn't let the pressure get to me and I made something amazing for Mr. Olundel. I didn't show any weakness to the pressure and kept focused on what needed to be done. The food had to be cooked and my own family's turmoil at being burnt couldn't distract me from cooking something amazing. Then there was the time when I cooked for Poitech and even though my planet was being ravaged and destroyed, I kept on cooking. I was determined to cook something amazing for Poitech, and everyone else were afraid and relieved that our planet was finally going to see its death after billions of years of dying. I kept on cooking and some of the cooks let the pressure of planet being destroyed get to them and they broke down, but I didn't. I must always be moving forward and always be improving even if my planet won't exist anymore, the least I could do was cook something amazing. Then there was the time I was cooking and I was put on fire, knives were being stabbed into me and I still kept on cooking. I didn't let the pressure of being burned and stabbed break me down and I kept on cooking, for Mr. Tulak. Mr. Tulak was going to have the best meal of his life and the amount of pressure that was on me, it wasn't going to get me to break down. I kept on cooking never showing stress and never giving in to the pressure of being burned and stabbed. Then when the other cooks started to bite me and eat some of the eat off my bones, I kept on cooking. I didn't let the pressure of the other cooks attacking me, let my cooking down. I kept on cooking no matter how much pressure was on me. I can take the pressure and I can make something great out of it. Let the other cooks eat me, I am an unhealthy food choice for them and they all started get heart attacks after having a bite out of my body. I still kept cooking. This marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. 
see you until next time.